Good morning. I'm Stephen Applegate, the Interim Rector of All Saints Episcopal Church here in the Ravenswood neighborhood of Chicago, Illinois. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this service of worship for the third Sunday after the Epiphany. Today is also the day of All Saints annual meeting, and I hope that many of you who are our guests at this service will stay on for the fun and the enjoyment of the annual meeting as we celebrate another year of ministry together. But for now, please take a moment to prepare yourself in heart and mind to worship together. Blessed be God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. And blessed, blessed be God's be kingdom, kingdom, now and forever. forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior Jesus Christ, and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed in God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed God's mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The Word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they have none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as if they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Good morning. My name is Rob Lentz, and I am honored to be here with you all in my bedroom. This is my last Sunday as your vestry co-warden, and it is my privilege to deliver this morning's sermon. What a week to be preaching, and I'm not talking about the annual meeting. If you're new to All Saints and or the Episcopal Church, I should probably explain a few things. In the Episcopal Church, the vestry is the parish's governing council much like a board of directors, and two wardens serve as the leader. At All Saints, my co-warden is the inestimable Scotty Caldwell, who will be taking over as I retire to the mansions of rest. Each year, congregations hold an annual meeting to review the mind-numbing business of the church, elect vestry members, and vote on the budget. Here at All Saints, we take the annual meeting to an entirely different level, like 11. Our yearly cavalcade of Episcopalian revelry has this year been formatted to fit your screens, but I can assure you it will be filled with the familiar outlandish costumes, inside jokes, Star Wars references, and everything else we could think of to bring our dreary church business to life. The only thing missing is the mid-morning chili and beer, but I'm confident that you all are managing your own craft services at home. In my four years on the All Saints Vestry, I've seen some amazing things. 
After completing the restoration of our historic church, the purchase of a house on the south end of our campus, the hiring of an outstanding associate rector, the election of our longtime rector as Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Michigan, the hiring of an exceptional interim rector, and beginning a comprehensive search for the congregation's next leader. A global pandemic, an economic recession, the turmoil brought on by the murder of George Floyd, an unprecedented fundraising effort, the Green Lining Campaign, to address the legacy of racist housing policies on the west side of Chicago, an awesome new website, plans to restore our long neglected rectory, and most importantly, the incredible collective effort to hold together and lift up this congregation through unimaginably hard times. The storming of our nation's capital was only the latest in a long line of stomach-churning displays of division and white supremacy. But this week, for the first time in years, many of us dared to experience an unaccustomed yet familiar sensation, hope. If the inauguration of Joe Biden marks the dawn of a new age of hope, then it is certainly true that the darkest hour is just before the dawn. How many of us, traumatized by the fresh memory of the Capitol insurrection, dreaded Wednesday, and the possibility of more violence, more division, more crazy? As Ann Applebaum writes in The Atlantic, in December, 34% of Americans said they did not trust the outcome of the 2020 election. More recently, 21% said that they either strongly support or somewhat support the storming of the Capitol building. As of this week, 32% were still telling pollsters that Biden was not the legitimate winner. With fears of white supremacists and seditionists embedded in the National Guard and law enforcement, the days leading up to inauguration were unbearably tense. But on the appointed day, it was bright and clear, and in spite of the masks and social distancing, the whole thing felt normal orderly, and like the appearance of a green lightsaber in a gloved hand, that old-time feeling of hope returned, with patriotic songs and a hand upon the Bible, the giant artifact that has been in Biden's family since 1893. The transfer of power happened, but it can't be called peaceful this time, and it felt like the cursed year 2020, stretching into its 13th month, had finally ended. Could it be then that our long national nightmare, that endless Zoom meeting was finally drawing to a close? That glitchy, lagging, unmuted year that could have been an email? I'm going to call January 20th the first day of 2021. King George III, another outgoing tyrant in an earlier age, had a small query for our new nation. What comes next? You've been freed. Do you know how hard it is to lead? It's tempting to want to run out into the streets and sing, ding dong, the witch is dead, with your mask on, of course. To breathe that deep four year sigh of relief and declare our sea of troubles ended. In response to the violence in Charlottesville during the summer of hate in 2017, President Biden framed his campaign as a battle for the soul of the nation. In his inaugural address, he pleaded for unity and healing, for treating our fellow citizens with dignity and respect. But there's a problem. And the people of Charlottesville themselves, interviewed in the New York Times following Biden's inauguration, have some thoughts about it. The Reverend Phil Woodson, associate pastor of First Methodist United Church, was quoted as saying, unity is not uniformity, and unity is not without accountability. It's really hard to be unified with people if you don't have a common understanding of truth and a common understanding of justice. Otherwise, we're speaking completely different languages. Awesome. Wow. Do you have a clue what happens now? There's going to be some Hamilton references. It's, it's all saints. 
Speaking of the Capitol rioters and those who have supported or abetted them, Ann Applebaum of The Atlantic further explains, they declared that they want to live in a different America from the rest, the, from the one the rest of us inhabit, ruled over by a different president, chosen according to a different rule book. And yet they cannot be wished away or sent away or somehow locked up. We have no choice but to coexist. How do we coexist with such fundamental differences? Based on the experiences of other nations that have navigated the process of truth and reconciliation following prolonged internal conflict, the colonist offers a radical idea. Change the subject. Do something constructive that makes people work alongside people they hate. She cites the examples of Northern Ireland, Liberia, South Africa, countries where political opponents have seen each other not just as wrong, but evil. Countries where people are genuinely frightened when the other side takes power. Countries where not all arguments can be solved and not all differences can be bridged. In the peacebuilding projects of Northern Ireland, Catholics and Protestants didn't debate politics. They built community centers, repaired infrastructure, and focused on job training for young people. I'm not convinced that relatively small actions such as these will repair what's really broken, but it's shocking to consider that we're at a point where we need to take cues from Northern Ireland to reconcile the fractures in our own country. On Thursday of this week, the day after inauguration, I attended the last session of Pathways to Reconciliation, the six-week examination of systemic racism and white supremacy that specifically addresses the Episcopal Church. Like many of the anti-racist trainings that All Saints has undertaken in the last several years, the work here is internal. It requires an unflinching analysis of our own behavior as individuals and as a denomination. It is difficult and uncomfortable work to confront both the distant past that we've inherited and our individual shortcomings as white people. Our entitlement, our willful blindness to injustice, and the ways we have perpetuated oppression, seen and unseen, things done and left undone. One of the crucial texts that we examined is Speaking of Freedom, a letter to the church on breaking free of white supremacy by Kelly Brown Douglas, Stephanie Speller, and Winnie Varghese. The authors ask, can a denomination steeped in white supremacy turn and dedicate its life to dismantling the very structures of death that it blessed and built? Can it, be can it become beloved community where the flourishing of every person and all creation is the hope of each, where the oppressed are liberated from oppression and oppressors are at last free of the sin that oppresses. We can do more than hope. It's on us to make the choice of silence or do the hard work of transformative truth-telling. Oceans rise, empires fall. It's much harder when it's all your call. I don't know what comes next for the nation, I can only carry forward the hope that I felt on Wednesday, the hope that our new leaders will embrace justice as a path towards unity and not prefer, quote, the false piece of decorum to the true progress of democracy. I hope that for once we'll listen to Senator Bernie Sanders. Bernie said in his sensible parka and teacher made mittens, what we need to do now is in very bold and clear ways, Make people understand government is directly improving their lives. He would also ask once again that you renew your pledge to all saints. I know what comes next for me, besides a lot fewer Zoom meetings. Having seen a pathway to reconciliation, I can't unsee it. The patterns and practice of white supremacy are everywhere, if you care to look. Years ago, I remember being shown the FedEx logo as an exercise in visibility. Turns out there's an arrow between the E and the X that I had never noticed because it's negative space. It's white. As a graphic design nerd, I couldn't believe I'd never seen it. Someone else had to point it out for me. 
I know that my journey on this pathway to reconciliation is just starting, but I'm indescribably grateful to have this congregation to walk the way with me. As for all saints, what comes next is an annual meeting and new leadership and a continuation of the pathway towards becoming the love community. Thank you all very, very much. Amen. Let us join as we say the Nicene Creed together. We believe in one God, the Father, Father the Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen, seen and unseen. We, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, Christ the, only the only Son of God, God eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, 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 light from light, light true God from true God, God begotten and not made, of the one being with the Father, through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he was suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, and has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and natural church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Gracious God, your Son revealed in signs and wonders the greatness of your saving love. In this time of war and chaos, May we work for justice and peace in the world. Gracious God, guide our leaders and elected officials that they may be filled with your wisdom, vision, and compassion. Open our eyes to the wonders of your creation around us and make us faithful stewards of our world's natural resources. Lord, hear our We give you thanks for the blessings in our lives. Gracious God, Fill us with compassion and enable us to use our talents and resources to care for the sick, feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, and comfort the lonely people of our communities. Gracious God, we remember now all who have died 
and find their rest in you. Exchange a sign of peace with one another. Now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets and their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will they were created and have their being. From the primal elements you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for we are sinners in your sight. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood, he reconciled us. By his His wounds, we we are healed. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. And so, Lord, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving. We celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our ancestors, God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, of Jacob, Leah and Rachel, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. 
Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, O God, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor and glory and worship from generation to generation. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy will be done, done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. of God, and we are the people of God.
us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we, we thank, thank you, you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Friends, life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who journey the way with us. So be swift to love, and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God, creator, Christ, and giver of new life be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. It is time for announcements. I will turn things over to our interim rector, the Reverend Dr. Stephen Applegate. Thank you, Courtney. And welcome again to this service here at All Saints Chicago. I wanted to have um, the announcements take place here because although I did the welcome from this same place earlier this morning, some of you aren't always prompt at coming to church on Sundays. <laughs> so I wanted you to see all of the work that's going on here behind me and overhead as well. The painters and plasterers have been here all week working on repairs. When they're done with their work, the floors of this beautiful church will be refinished as well. So a lot going on while we are worshiping remotely, and I wanted you to be aware of it. Today, of course, is the annual meeting of the parish. It's one of the great celebrations in the life of this church. Although the meeting won't officially start until 1015, I'm going to encourage you as soon as this service is over to switch over to Zoom because we've got some very special things starting as early as 10.05. Um, the Zoom link is in the newsletter. It's um, easy to find. If you can't find it for some reason, please email me this morning, stephen at allsaintschicago.org. Since the theme of this year's annual meeting is All Saints, All Stars, and we've talked about this before, I certainly hope that, you, hope that you'll have your best red carpet attire on this morning so that we can all see each other looking like we are walking the red carpet at one of the great awards shows because this one is a great awards show. Thanks to Rob Lenz for his sermon today. Um, some closing words as he finishes his term as co-warden and I simply want to add my personal thanks to Rob for serving in this capacity and for all of the help that he's provided to me as I've come here to serve as your interim. Rob and Scotty Caldwell, our other co-warden, will be leading the annual meeting today. Adult formation begins again this Wednesday. We're going back to Wednesday from Thursday. We're going to be doing a three-week series called Experiencing God in Prayer. And our own Andrew Rutledge will kick us off at 7.30 on the 27th as he's talking about the daily office and particularly about morning prayer, which he leads here at All Saints every Monday through Friday at 8.30 in the morning. This Thursday, January 28th at 7.30, we're showing The Color Tax. It's a terrific film about racial injustice in housing in Chicago. And um, it's important that you register to participate because registration is what gets you into the movie and also into the panel discussion that follows the movie. John Williams will be leading that panel discussion. He'll be the moderator. He'll be joined by Anne McKenzie, a parishioner, and also um, someone who works at the Chicago Housing Authority. Richard Townsell will be here, the executive director of Lawndale Christian Development Corporation, the group that benefited from the Green Lining campaign this past summer. And finally, Bruce Orenstein himself, the filmmaker, will be joining us. 
please join the other 50 people who have already registered for this very special event and join us on Thursday night. Brood Awakenings is taking a brief break this week as we go to the annual meeting, but I want to highlight what's coming next week. Colby Maddox, who's worked for the past 22 years at the Old Town School of Folk Music as a teacher, archivist, and librarian, will be leading us through the history of this amazing institution. And Colby promises to save some time at the end for some um, folk music himself. He'll be playing and encouraging us to sing along. So look forward to next week's Brood Awakenings event. Also looking ahead, Liturgy for Hard Times will be on February the 4th. Liturgy for Hard Times is our special liturgy to help us all deal with the hurts and disappointments that are part of everyday life and to turn us toward hope and the light during this season. Eileen Crowley leads that. If you would please email her, she will give you the information that you need to join that liturgy. Finally, if you have any remaining kitchen donations for the Midwest veterans, please bring them to the back glass doors of the church or call Katie Nolan or Therese Stasek and they'll be happy to come and pick those up. That ends next week and so we'd like to get those in as soon as possible. Are there any other announcements this morning? I was kind of looking up at the top of the scaffolding to see if there might be. But seeing no one, let's join together in the prayer for the search committee as they continue their work. Let us pray. O oh, eternal God, the foundation of all wisdom and the source of all inspiration, enlighten, enlighten with your grace the rector search, search committee of this congregation, congregation and, and so, so rule, rule their, their minds and open, open their, their hearts and guide, guide their, their deliberations, deliberations that in their work they may seek your glory and promote the mission of your church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we'll have Courtney come back and um, introduce our closing hymn and dismiss us. Please join in our closing hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Thanks be to God. God.